Mitra ji, WWG staff, to uh, start with ICM Moto. Shasupte Shuja Krati Yae Shasupte Shuja Krati Kamam 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 Shok Shok Nirvi Mana Nirvi Mana Adeva Shukram Adeva Shukradam Good afternoon, everyone. I wish all of you happy Dashera. Today is the last day of our intern symposium. The faculty of the session, CA Suraj Rampuriyaji. The co-panelist for the panel discussion, C. Aditya Jain and C. Abhilash Brahmin. My council colleague, C. A. Sinjay Nigam. And all participants, good evening all of you. First of all, let me thank each one of you for joining on the auspicious day of the Shira. And this being the symposium today ends on this day, I am sure that this has a lot of positivity and knowledge for all of us. Not taking much time further, I request my council colleague Sanjay Nikam to give a short address and also provide introduction of the faculty. Uh, thank you, Chintan Bhai. And uh, I see a Sanjay Nikam, Regional Council of the uh, Council member of WIRC and uh, Student Academic Committee Chairman. Take this liberty and privilege to uh, wish all of you a happy Dasera and uh, welcome you on this auspicious day of Dasera to attend the webinar on uh, Internet Audit uh, uh, Symposium. Uh, friends, this honor for me to be part of this uh, webinar and to share dice with such a reputed and uh, re uh, renowned faculties uh, to share their and to, to listen them on their for their expertise and uh, uh, experience in this uh, internal audit uh, segment. Friends, uh, I have been given a responsibility and honor to introduce today's uh, dignitary for the first session, CA uh, Suraj uh, Rampuriya, sir. CA Suraj Kumar Rampuriya is senior partner at uh, Messrs. V. Singhvi and Associates and is based out of uh, Hyderabad. He is alumni of a St. Xavier's College, Kolkata and qualified as a chartered accountant in 1994. Throughout his career, he has been a key player in both the practice of auditing, including a stint at a big four, uh, big four firms and senior role uh, within the corporate industries. His portfolio uh, boasts a, a multitude of successfully delivered as, uh, assignmental across the spectrum of assurance services, accounting, administration, and system implementation, both in India and internationally. One of the uh, distinguishing aspects of Mr. Rampuria's career is his extensive experience in internal audit, uh, where he has worked with some of the largest corporations. This perspective from both sides of the table provides him with a unique insight uh, into uh, the new, uh, nuisance, nuance of uh, intricacies of corporate auditing processes. Beyond his impressive professional 
accomplishments mr rampuria possesses a pure poetic inclination that adds a unique dimension to his character it would be captivating to gain insights from a senior chartered accountant who has handled internal audit both as auditor and auditee so uh, join me with big round of applause to invite uh, such a renowned faculty suraj rampuri sir to share his knowledge and experience with us this is uh, uh, your sir suraj rampuri sir please take the charge yeah uh, before uh, suraj ji uh, i think uh, let me just uh, give a brief uh, suraj ji you have been mute you can unmute uh, meanwhile uh, thank you so much sanjay bhai uh, i think your uh, initial words of uh, wisdom and giving sharing the faculty's profile it really sets up the today's stage and we can really see that uh, sir has been suraj uh, rampuri sir has been a very seasoned experienced person when you just look at his profile uh, he has uh, immense experience of android industry and uh, today topic is much more relevant because now everybody is looking after not only intro audit they are looking for so much more than intro audit because audit is now looked at as a more forensic whether it is stat audit or intro audit so the perspective of the auditor perspective of audit has completely changed and uh, i must uh, uh compliments uh, today's faculty he is so senior but when we talk about icai giving his experience sharing experience on icai he has immediately accepted my request sir thank you once again for coming and sharing and coming here and spare your time sir now i transfer stage to you my to you for your kind words thank you thank you so much uh, cia nikam ji and thank you so much cia chintan bhai it has been a pleasure to be here and wish you all the panelists and attendees a very very happy dashera on this special day you have taken out time for me to address you on this special topic on fraud prevention and the management's perspective and audit approach on it it's a really interesting topic a lot to learn lot to unlearn lot to hear and lot to share so all these we are going to do throughout the next one one hour and a few minutes so i would request all your attention and uh, uh, i would also re uh, request your question and answers towards the end of the session uh, so that i can uh, reply to most of them and also we have a great panelists out here who can uh, deliberate it in the subsequent discussion also if required so with your permission can i share my screen yes sir please Yes, sir. We can see your screen. Okay. So from yeah. Hope hope it is visible to all. Yes, it is visible. Yes, sir. Okay. So let's start. so welcome to the seminar on critical role of internal auditors in preventing and detecting fraud while exploring the management's viewpoint this is the topic given to me and i'll be elaborating it in the next few minutes so in the recent corporate india we have seen a lot of frauds that have taken place this sets up the background for the today's topic when we talk of fraud fraud prevention management internal audit let us also have a just a brief idea of what has happened in the last few years relating to fraud in india i'll just mention a few names abg shipyard kingfisher airlines ilfs pnb bank of india uh, sorry bank of baroda icici bank loan sdi fraud so all these things you can go through in uh, various news and other uh, sources you can understand what kind of frauds that has been perpetrated during this uh, uh, in these companies so we need, in this backdrop what i would also like to mention that there was a survey conducted though not officially vetted or anything done by me or any of us 
uh, almost 50% of the companies have experienced some kind of a fraud, economic or otherwise, in last two years. And what is uh, further uh, uh, of import is that uh, these frauds have been carried out as a result of disruption caused by fraud, uh, caused by COVID-19, and also development in techniques. Not only the system developers are developing, developing the systems, the fraudsters are also getting smarter. They are also coming up with new and new techniques to put on new frauds on the corporates and otherwise. So let us look into the definition of fraud. When we talk of fraud and fraud prevention, what is most important, most relevant is the definition of fraud. Fraud, fraud is an inter intentional or deliberate act to deprive another of property or money by deception or other unfair means. This is a definition given by Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. What they have looked into, they have seen that people are doing fraud. What kind of fraud? Who are they? What are the important features of these fraud that has been perpetrated? So what we find that is the most important thing is knowing and intentional act. Knowing and intentional act to do what? To deprive others of property or take out some kind of benefits. And through what? Again, it is through unfair means. So what is happening? Everything is wrong. The in malafide intent is there. Malafide objective is there. And then use of unfair means by taking out advantage of system failures or system weaknesses. So fraud is basically intentional, deliberate act. So let us further dwell into it. So motive of fraud. What is the motive of fraud? It is to obtain some kind of a money, property or service or avoid payments or loss of services. What is the objective? To benefit, secure personal and other advantages from this activity. So we understand what is fraud, what is the motive behind the fraud. So if there is a fraud, we also think of fraud prevention. If we think of pro uh, fraud, fraud prevention, what is the measures? The measures are, again, for the purpose of protecting financial resources, reputation, and legal compliance of the company, which become so important in operationalizing the corporate. Now, what does this also do? This in ensures that there is a long-term sustainability and success of organization is far. The uh, organization uh, benefits in the long run. So having understood this, let us understand the famous fraud triangle, the fraud triangle. It has been in uh, knowledge of all, of all the chartered accountants and other practitioners in also the forensic auditors and others wherein they understand why a fraud is done. Fraud is done because of the incentive or pressure that a person feels, a person or a group of persons or a management, they feel that this kind of a activity can be done or they want to do it. And what also happens is they find opportunities. There are system lacunas, system weaknesses, or in some other way, they can play around, fiddle with that system to get that undue advantage. More, more importantly, they also have that attitude to rationalize that kind of a fraud or the act that they are trying to create to commit fraud. Having said this, let us understand the ways in which we can break the fraud triangle. Let us go back to the fraud triangle. So there are three aspects, incentives, opportunities, attitudes, and rationalization. If you see on the top and the right hand side, these two uh, portions, these talk about what is from the fraudster. The opportunities, these are given by the corporates. In today's context, we are talking about the corporates. 
frauds that are happening around there. So opportunities that are available in the corporates, these are the opportunities on which the other person acts to take out the undue advantage. So basic objective of that corporate should be to minimize this kind of opportunities so that the no undue advantage or any kind of a willful uh, mischief is done. So now anti-fraud programs and controls. So when we say of uh, fraud prevention, we think of anti-fraud programs and controls. So what is there? The intent of the management? What is the management intending? What is uh, its tolerance on the fraud? What kind of code and ethical behavior it has created in the in organization? What are the whistleblower policies? Whether whistleblowers are entertained? And if so, anonymity is maintained and all those things. So tone at the top is very important to have an anti-fraud program or policy in place. Once this tone is done, what is required is identifying the fraud risk factors, the environment in which the fraud may happen. What are the weaknesses or the so-called uh, uh, control lapses that may happen within the corporate or maybe done by people outside the corporate on the corporate. So all these risk factors need to be factored in. Based on that, a designing of the fraud risk plan is to be done, which is to be carefully and effectively communicated and trained across the organization so that the blood flows across, that it there is a zero tolerance policy, the plans are in place, any, any vitiating aspect or anything will not be easily taken up. And when it is properly communicated, the monitoring and effectiveness, including the role of the internal auditor comes in place. The internal auditor here, what he does, he understands that, okay, these are the policies, these are the programs, these, this is how it has been communicated. This is how the design and things have been put in place. Now they will monitor the effectiveness and weaknesses in that so that further improvement is done. And in case any lapses are noted for further corrective measures and remedial action. So these are basically to sum up anti-fraud programs and controls that should be generally in place in a corporate organization. So what are the types of fraud? See, before we go into fraud prevention and all those things in detail, we need to understand what kind of frauds are possible or what, what, what is happening in the current world and where we need to be alert. So there are uh, frauds in which monetary, and most of the frauds are having monetary content in it and these are called financial frauds. Asset misappropriation is misuse of property of the organization and property can be in various forms. We can look at the asset side. Most of it is well covered there. So corruption is what? Corruption is unethical behavior to put in short. And that includes bribery, extortion and multiple other forms. So what we need to understand is these three are important types of fraud, financial asset misappropriation and corruption. Further, if we see another type of fraud is fraud committed by management itself. And management fraud is mostly, mostly to put a deceptive kind of a financial statements or manipulating the numbers, putting wrong uh, impression before the uh, statutory authorities or other reporting requirements. So the, those kind of pressures the management have to increase the value of the shares or maybe other things. And uh, similarly, there are other frauds which is not done by management, but by the employees of the company. Why, how the employees are doing? They have got a certain uh, positional advantage wherein they can use the three pillars of those uh, of that triangle and once everything fi they find conducive they resort to this thing the most recent development in fraud is cyber fraud so technology has given us so many things and technology bereft's us with so many issues also lot of advantages that we have in day to day life sometimes become a nightmare. Hacking and other things are so so uh, prevalent these days. 
So cyber fraud is another type of fraud that we also need to factor. So what we need to understand is what is the importance of fraud prevention? Why fraud prevention? Fraud prevention is to ensure that the company or the corporate is financially stable, continues to be financially stable, profitable, and everything is well safeguarded. It also ensures that reputation of the company is an integral part of its existence. If reputation is there, other things of flow. So reputation management is also an important part of fraud prevention. Compliance. If a company is non-compliant or if it is fraudulently complying with the wrong numbers or other things, it may lead to punishment, penalties, and other consequences. Fraud prevention also results in increasing the efficiency of the organization, the way it works, the way it operates, and it can get numerous benefits out of operational efficiency. So fraud prevention, why it is also important? Employee morale. See, if a company is prone to frauds or if frauds have happened there, the trust is lost. Employees do not have that motivation to work hard. Even if they work hard or even if they work correctly, they have that kind of a suspicion in their mind. Someone else may do something else and they will be held responsible for it. So employee morale comes to a low if there is a fraud, uh, fraud angle there or maybe some inclination of fraud or existence of fraud. So legal and ethical obligations, again, is an important factor for fraud prevention. A corporate has so many obligations to satisfy. It has to report to SEBI, to so many other places, including the tax and other authorities. So if these are wrongly reported, there is a fraud. There, is, there are so many consequences. So prevention, again, becomes an important aspect. Coming to another important uh, feature of fraud prevention is competitive advantage. If a company is ethical, it is strong, it has robust uh, fraud minimization program, a strong internal audit structure, all these things give uh, overall confidence within the company and outside to the general globe that we are strong. And that gives a uh, remarkable advantage over its competitors. So finally, all these things, what I have said, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, these all lead to what? Cost reduction, increased profitability, and benefits to the stakeholders. So fraud prevention is, in a way, an important tool that leads to the success of the organization. Now, this is something we need to really think about, responsibility for fraud and its prevention. So two words are there, important words, fraud and fraud prevention. Fraud is the responsibility for the uh, on the person who perpetuates the fraud. He has to be accountable. He'll be the criminal person. He'll, he has done the wrong. He should be the ultimate responsibility point. Now, distinguishing fraud with fraud prevention, fraud prevention, as the word says, prevention of fraud. So the role of prevention of fraud lies with the management of the company, those charged with the governance, including the internal auditor and the audit committee. So fraud and pre fraud, fraud prevention, we need to distinguish between the two and then come up with the fraud prevention measures, the controls, the management perspective, the internal audit aspects and other things. I hope I'm uh, clear in my presentation so far. Any feedback, please? A request any to... Uh, may, uh, yeah, request to dignitaries. Uh, if you have any questions, you can put it in question and answer uh, session uh, section. Okay, thank you so much. This really yep. uh, increases my motivation going forward, sir. Thank you. Yep, thank you, sir. So now what I'll be doing is, I'll be reading the text. Now text from where? Text from SA 240. SA 240 talks about the auditor's responsibilities relating to fraud in an 
audit of financial statements, responsibility for the prevention and detection of fraud. Ladies and gentlemen, the primary responsibility for prevention and detection of fraud rests both with those uh, charged with governance of the entity and the management. It is important that management with the oversight of those charged with governance place a strong emphasis on fraud prevention, which may reduce opportunities for fraud to take place, fraud deterrence, which could persuade individuals not to commit fraud because of likelihood of detection and punishment. This involves a commitment to creating a culture of honesty and ethical behavior, which can be reinforced by an active oversight by those charged with governance. This is an important line. The, further, in exercising oversight responsibilities, those charged with governance consider the potential for override of controls and other inappropriate influence over the financial reporting process, such as efforts by management to manage earnings in order to influence the perceptions of analysts as to entities' performance and profitability. Let me quickly also come with another uh, uh, quotation from the essay 240, which talks about the responsibility of the auditors. An auditor conducting an audit in accordance with essays is responsible for obtaining a reasonable assurance that financial statements taken as a whole are free from material misstatement, whether caused by fraud or error. Owing to the inherent limitations of audit, there is an unavoidable risk that some material misstatements of the finance, financial statements may not be detected, even though the audit is properly planned and performed in accordance with the essays. In spite of uh, performing as per essays, there, is a, there are unavoidable risks that fraud may, not, may or may not be detected. Evolution of fraud risk factors. Evaluation, sorry. The auditor shall evaluate whether the information obtained from the other risk assessment procedures and related activities performed indicates that one or more fraud risk factors are present. While fraud risk factors may not necessarily indicate the existence of fraud, they have often been presented present in circumstances where frauds have occurred and therefore may indicate risk of material misstatement due to fraud. So what is this? This is saying that how to evaluate fraud risk factors and how to understand red flags. So this we'll be discussing as we move further. So when we talk of fraud responsibility, fraud prevention responsibilities lying with the management and TCWG, we talk of fraud prevention plan. So what is fraud prevention plan? It is a statement about entity's tolerance for fraud risk. How the entity views uh, risk of fraud. How it key outlines the key responsibilities for uh, fraud control. How it nominates a senior official or other personnel so that fraud, if or, uh, it happens. So how to look into it. Where, uh, where to emphasize uh, whether the reporting mechanism and other things are in place. A summary of relevant awareness raising and training strategies are to be developed. When we have a plan, we need to have a plan that is supported by awareness, supported by training to the person who are going to re review it, who are going to evaluate on it, who are going to report, and who are going to finally be responsible for it. The plan should also have a summary of how entity assesses fraud risk and treats vulnerability, where the organization is susceptible. Those areas need to be focused by the management. Those are the areas where they need to put extra importance. There, they need to have the extra plans in place, the uh, designing of it, then monitoring of it. And on, of course, if there are any weaknesses or any flags to report on it. So after we talk of plan, we also need to understand the strategies to prevent fraud. So a fraud prevention measure requires the following strategies. It requires internal audit fraud detection system to use multiple technologies, including data analytical, analytics, artificial intelligence, and other tools which are effective in finding out the symptoms of fraud, 
existence of fraud and ways and means to reduce or eliminate fraud. So this thing becomes really important and pertinent in today's context. What is also need to be under, understood and emphasized is strengthening the internal controls and processes so that the policies of the management with respect to fraud and the overall policies of the company are duly followed and adhered throughout the organization. What is the most important part that plays in prevention of fraud is implementation of a good SOP standard operating procedures, delegation of authority and authorization metrics and other things, which ensures that no one person is having a good control or a sizable control or a complete control over certain aspect of the transaction, which may so impact the activity that a fraud or any other unlawful activity or any kind of undue advantage can be taken out. So implementing a, a segregation of duties, dual powers, and reducing the risk of fraud is an important tool. I had mentioned earlier that how to find out red flags, what is the significance of red flags. So red flags are indicators that they give us an indication. Yes, something is suspicious, something is wrong. Or kuch galat ho sakta hai. We need to focus. Ye thoda normal nahi dikh raha. This is out of the way. So what, what, what the management, TCWG, internal auditor, the, what they need to understand? They need to understand in their context and in the context of their industry and in the context of their operations, what are the characteristics of fraud, techniques used to commit fraud, and the schemes and scenarios that may impact the corporate and its operations. So to evaluate indicators of fraud, the fraud prevention team, they need to understand what actions are necessary, what kind of investigations should be carried out, and what kind of plan should be put in place. Needless to say, it is always important to continuously evaluate the effectiveness of controls that prevent fraud. I would uh, discuss two red flags that came to my notice or I want to put be, uh, before your knowledge. These are basically examples of red flags. Red flags is if the segregation of duties is not there. And uh, let us say in, in maker and checker, they have a, a corporate has put in such a structure where any one person puts in a entry, another person uh, approves it. There may be chances where the senior person puts in the entry, the junior person may approve it. That can be, that can be possible. Ideally, what is required? The junior does it, senior analyzes it, evaluates it, finds it correct, and he approves it. But in case these things are not there, then there is an anomaly in segregation of duties. And it is an important red flag for an auditor to understand, yes, things may go wrong, things may be corrupted, people may misuse. So similar, another example that had come to me in another day-to-day -day life, a staff coming to us, a very, very junior or a uh, low, uh, 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 staff coming to office in a BMW or a very hi-fi car and doing kind of a very, very small level job. So that gives me an indication for what is happening. Why should he come in a BMW and do this kind of work? He is capable enough and he is financially well off. So if he is coming here, he is getting some kind of undue advantage. That gives me a skepticism uh, trigger. It, it uh, invites me to think that that area may be weak, the areas where he is working, that may be susceptible to various kind of play around. It is, I'm not saying that, uh, yes, there is something, 
but it is an indicator indicator in the sense it is a red flag so a few red more uh, few more red flags that we can discuss out here is fund transfer transferred from a vending machine in a mall to the employees of the company in respect of payments which are payable by the users to the company so the vending machine is used by the employees and the amount is transferred to their account and from their account to the company if the auditor comes to note that this kind of things are happening it gives him an immediate attention that yes something can go wrong it is a red flag there have been instances wherein various departments or hr has laid off staff without disconnecting their access and often it has also been found that those people continue to use it or misuse it to advantage disadvantage or what whatever kind of play off so this is another red flag whether these controls are there whether the proper it audit has been done all these loopholes have been plugged or not these are important flags and important fraud prevention measures i am not saying frauds have happened but fraud can happen similarly what happens if the company gives access to outsiders to their systems and outsiders may be smart enough i said they have, today people are tax savvy so what they can do is they can get undue access undue they will have more knowledge about the company's systems processes and other things and there have been instances wherein they have brought down the entire application down this sometimes we call cyber hacking hacking of it system and all those things a lot of this is in public domain we can very well look into it understand from them and understand about the controls and uh, mechanisms the corporates are having to reduce cyber crime and other kinds of frauds so why we have a talking about fraud prevention measures so then some questions come to mind so what, when we are using this fraud prevention measures what are the key questions that the management should have in mind does the organization have fraud response plan if fraud has happened what is the response what are what are the key policies how it will be investigated how it will be reported who carries the fraud investigation whether the internal audit is tasked with uh, fraud uh, risk identifying the fraud risk then investigating the fraud risk even if the internal audit is tasked with identifying fraud risk and also to evaluate the fraud risk what is more important is whether the internal audit department has been strengthened or put in such a position that it has got all the skill sets to understand the fraud look into it investigate and report it to the audit committee tcwg and help the help or assist the management in reporting at the appropriate places and not only reporting further taking up corrective corrective and remedial measures so that this is reduced at the future so having discussed fraud, uh, fraud prevention measures and all these things so far we come up with a very important question whose responsibility is there in fraud prevention slightly i dwelled on it i said the primarily responsible primary responsibility lies with the executive board and then the internal audit below firstly the executive board has the final responsibility i repeat final responsibility for implementing mechanisms of detecting and preventing of fraud at the earliest earlier the better so that the fraud does not happen at all in case it happens how to report where to report when to report there are systems and procedures on that the management of the executive board are those who should offer explanations and appropriately report in the case in case they discover existence of fraud now what is the role of internal auditor the internal auditor's role include a varied set of responsibilities it supports the management 
is facilitate it facilitates the assessment of fraud. So assessment of fraud risk, they look into it, assessing the connection between the fraud risk and the internal control. Now, this is an important connect. Fraud risk factors, internal controls, whether they are aligning with each other. Supporting the specialists in fraud investigation, if there are specialists appointed, whether internal audit is assisting them, guiding them, giving them the key inputs that they have come across or which require further investigations. Supporting the effort to rectify deficiencies if any fraud has happened or anything that has come to their notice, which require improvements, suggest the improvements, ensure that the management take uh, due cognizance of it. And if it is implemented, ensure proper implementation. The role of the internal auditor is also important when we see it's reporting to the audit committee regarding the problems on, they have noted on anti-fraud mechanism and other aspects, which may or may not lead to fraud. So responsibility of the fraud, here we, what we also talk about is the internal audit refers to what? It refers to a permanent review. It is an ongoing process normally. Normally, I'm again saying with respect to what kind of engagement uh, they have been put into. So accordingly, they have to perform those duties. Assessing on behalf of the corporate uh, regarding examination of uh, the financials, evaluation of task and uh, and conformity of accounting entries, policies, and other aspects of the financial statements, attestation and certification of financial accounting documents. So internal audit also looks into the attestation and certification of financials. This we'll again further uh, discuss as we come with a uh, few interesting examples uh, in the later part of the session. So when we talk of management's perspective and other things, we also talk about responsibility. Its responsibility is for prevention, for detection, and for response. So three aspects. First, plan a good uh, uh, fraud management uh, uh, plan. Strategize. Ensure policies to monitor the implementation. That is That also results in detection. In case anything is detected, what is the remedial action course of course corrective measures and then reporting at the appropriate forums. So when we talk of responsibilities perspective of a management, what it becomes important is expectations and responsibilities. So management expects so many things from the internal auditor. They have put a plan, they have put a design, they have implemented the structure. So internal auditor is expected to ensure this thing operates nicely, any weaknesses pointed out, and then any frauds or any indicators, red flags, etc., are duly discussed in time, before time, for corrective action. What is important is collaboration and communication between TCWG and the internal audit. This is the most important aspect. The management is responsible for fraud prevention. Internal auditors are assisting the management and the TCWG in fraud prevention. So what is important? They should have a very good kind of an understanding or very good kind of bonding. So this bonding, again, when I'm saying a bonding, this does not mean a compromise. This does not mean a compromise on independence internal audit has to be independent of management. It is again emphasized that internal audit should not blindly look what the management says. It should independently carry out, carry out with professional skepticism, its professional duties, its plan, its execution, and other mechanisms to bring out an effective internal audit system. So when we talk of expectation of management, we talk of collaboration and communication, we talk of independence. What I also need to emphasize here out of experience is support that the management need to give to the internal audit. If we just put up an, uh, a shell and we call it internal audit department, is it effective? 
I strongly believe it is not. Unless it is powered with the knowledge, experience, those kind of tools, resources, backing, and so many other things that internal audit requires to carry out an effective, timely internal audit, and which in which will also again include the aspects of fraud. So perspective of management with respect to internal audit is again important with respect to fraud prevention. So as I mentioned earlier, so management perspective should also come up with support and cooperation. It should ensure independence and objectivity of the internal audit. Early detection by internal audit, they should encourage, take a, a immediate cognizance, and are, uh, the more, more early the remedial action, that is the better. So risk assessment and mitigation plan, again, need, need not be emphasized. These are very important aspects. We need to uh, continuously keep assessing fraud risk assessment. Sometimes we have to upgrade something. We, need, we may have to uh, downgrade the assessment level that we had earlier done and accordingly come up with the new, new assessment strategies and also the mitigation plan we have for fraud prevention. Internal control enhancement also again depends on the risk assessment and other perspectives of the management. Regulatory compliance is a lot of misreporting, wrong reporting happens with this, uh, when we are doing statutory compliances and other things. So management itself needs to be vigilant and the internal audit also need to be alert. Both the mechanism is such that they should ensure that proper compliance is done in time, right, and without encouraging any kind of litigation or moving back on what it has, what has been done. So all these things, what will happen when we talk of it, that we do legal compliance, we do this, we do that, all these things lead to cost saving. Efficiency improves. There is a morale boost to the employees. The com customers and the other stakeholders also have a confidence in the company. All these things result in what? Cost saving and profit maximization, which is a good objective of the corporate. So management, I, I understand, should also immediately investigate and uh, go for remediation measures when in, an internal audit points out some kind of suspicious activities that has come during the course of the internal audit. All these things that we have said is a continuous improvement. It is not a one-time effort or an yearly effort. It has to be done on a periodic basis as and when alerts come, they need to be really attended to. Communication and transparency, resource allocation, training and awareness, we have already discussed earlier. And these things are very important for an effective internal audit. So as we mentioned, management support to internal audit. See, the topic for us today is fraud prevention and detection. Management's expectation and audit approach. So what you must have noticed, we are talking a lot how management is perceiving the fraud, uh, what management is perceiving the internal audit, what management is perceiving the interplay between fraud risk prevention and internal audit effectiveness. So when we do all these things, so management need to collaborate with the internal auditors and while ensuring their independence, give them sufficient importance, make sure that they are fit enough to accept the challenges. They are having the desired knowledge, backing of the latest up-to-date technologies and other things. There are no resistance from the employees. They stay up-to-date with the evolving techniques and other things in the fraud uh, triangle and other things. What also need to be seen by the management is what are the best practices that are being taken in other industries or across other industries globally or otherwise, which can be implemented by the organization 
for an effective internal audit. Strong internal control framework, I need not emphasize to chartered accountants. This is one of the core areas for internal audit. Conducting regular risk assessment, continuous monitoring and data analytics, using of technique is important, sin qua non. So when I'm talking of so much of management perspective, what, what does it lead to? It leads to collaboration and partnership with the internal audit function. Internal auditors are an imp important and integral part of the organization. They are not uh, just a pull, uh, for policing around. They are uh, there to safeguard the assets of the organization, protect its reputation, ensure cost measures are there, and profitability is increased, and the confidence of the stakeholders is enhanced. So after the management perspective, what we also need to understand is what is the internal auditor's responsibility? So we were talking so far about this management should do, this management should put in place, this management should monitor, this management should support, this management should analyze, this management should report. So what does internal auditor do? Internal auditor is required to ensure that all these things that the management has given are duly complied with. And when they comply with it, what they find is detection. If they detect something, that has to be reported. So we come to the reporting aspect. These are to be reported in appropriate format, at appropriate place, in appropriate manner, with appropriate recommendation, with appropriate timelines and remedial measures. Highlighting the importance and the financial impact and other things to the appropriate authority. I have also mentioned about the recommendation. See, internal auditors, when we are saying they are having the adequate knowledge, technological expertise and other things, they are in a very good position and they are sitting outside to see what is happening, what can be done better, how it can be done better, who can do better, and those advisory roles are important. And that is what we call recommendation of internal auditor to the management to improve, enhance the internal controls and fraud risk prevention measures. So having said that these are the Roles of the internal auditor, what are the benefits? Benefits again look similar. What we were talking about the role, the role leads to the benefits. Benefits, early detection and prevention of fraud, strengthening internal controls, enhancing corporate governance. So enhancing corporate governance, ultimate benefit to the all the stakeholders. I would not say shareholders. All the stakeholders, stakeholders can be many. Government is a stakeholder. The public is a stakeholder, the customer is a stakeholder, the vendor is a stakeholder, employees are the stakeholders. So corporate governance is best practices for the corporate, implemented by the corporates in the best possible way, complying with the various rules and regulations. So when we talk of the role of the internal auditors and the benefits from internal auditors, what we should also discuss are the challenges those are being faced by the internal auditors. So internal auditors face multiple challenges primarily. One is whether they have got the good resources, where they, whether they have got the adequate resources, whether the adequate resources are independent. See, once I have noted that the internal audit is formed from the finance team itself and named internal audit and it, a separate department is formed, which again reports directly to the audit committee file. But then what is the problem? The, pro, uh, the people who have gone to the internal audit department are in the normal course of promotion, going to come back to the finance function and will be reporting to those people again who are in their finance. So even if they are not having immediate challenge, but tomorrow they will be susceptible to that. So having a good kind of internal audit team with proper independence and kind of objectivity that is required, they become strong and a very good effective internal audit team. And they should have that professional skepticism and resistance 
they should say yes we need to stop it and here we may go wrong so when when they when these challenges are faced whose role is to en uh, enhance their credibility it is the management who is directly responsible for fraud prevention so effectiveness of internal auditor again depends on the support and kind of comfort that the management gives to the internal auditors so ladies and gentlemen so far we were talking about the role of fraud prevention of the management its perspective role of the internal auditors in fraud prevention what is required of the internal auditor what is required of the management we are we should also look into the frauds that have been happ happening over the years and today being dashera or vijay dashmi as we call across india it is important that we take a few lessons from ramayana which has been guiding india over the years maybe hundreds and thousands of years but frauds were happening in that ramayana context which were duly taken care as as human uh, human evolved over the years they have taken good things from ramayana and to eliminate bad things so victory of good over evil how to control good how to eliminate evil that is what ramayana and corporates both need to do so when we talk of this what immediately comes to mind what are the similarities between ramayana and corporates if we come consider fraud concealment deceptive knowing unethical behavior and all those things we have come to the uh, certain uh, three important issues like deceit and deception unethical behavior violation of ethical principle so all these things lead to what conflict resolution so if there is a conflict there has to be a resolution so what also needs to understand okay so there is a fraud fraud committed fraud identified remedial action taken conflict resolved stress strengthening of the system all goody goody things coming in place but what is also important learning from the mistakes whatever mistakes we have done we need to ensure we do not repeat it we ensure that we we have adequate controls and checks and balances in place so that whatever wrong we have done or whatever wrong has been done for from ramayana in the you have real life question and from corporates in the corporate life balance so ramayana and corporates as we see from the fraud thing ramayana was mainly acting on fraud and how to overcome the fraud and how to ensure good prevails corporate a good corporate will ensure that there is no fraud if fraud is there or any chances of fraud eliminate them or if fraud is happening try to take it out report it appropriately and come up with the co good corporate behavior for the future so now let us come to the best practices that we can come up to have a good management perspective and an internal audit department so establishing a robust internal audit department as men emphasized earlier it is very important to have a good internal audit department if it is weak if it is ineffective no matter how good plan the management may think of implementation becomes the challenge continuation educate uh, continuous educa education and training need not to be emphasized one has to be updated and when the in uh, internal auditor is doing audit in the present times he has to live in the present times he has to do data analytics robotics forensic tools artificial intelligence he should understand what are the whistle blow whistle blowers uh, concerns that have been raised what are the fraud risk assessment and other good practices i mentioned earlier they should benchmark against best practices across industries across other auditors also so all these things if they put in together they benefit and who benefits more the corporate so this is basically what i wanted to talk on fraud fraud prevention management perspective internal audit and the approach of the internal auditor i hope i have been able to do justice to the subject so far what i would also like to just 
share with my audience out here a few of the internal perspective on fraud that has happened in the corporate globe over the past maybe few years and decade. I will not go into the individual details or other things. I would just simply say what are the frauds that have appeared in the news? What were the causes for the fraud? What was the what, what role could internal auditor play? So Enron scandal, everyone knows about it. UBS accounting policies, overstatement of profits, mark to market accounting, hiding debt and uh, their debt of the balance sheet. So what we noted was ineffective fraud detection techniques, ineffective audit procedures. So or internal audit, uh, uh, in my opinion, was not so strong to look into these things. And since it was not a overnight thing, it could have been captured by an effective internal audit over a period of time. So WorldCom accounting uh, fraud, again, exaggeration of revenue, reported uh, re uh, reduced reporting line cost. Again, this is inflation of profit. So again, one of the largest scandals of the uh, scandals uh, in the history. So internal audit, again, limited access. Internal auditors, may, maybe they were not having those that kind of a control on the financial statements. They could have improved their uh, relationship with the management and independently checking these areas and things could have been better over the years. Siemens bribery scandal. Again, this, this is typical. Here in what happened, the employees of the company bribed the government to take undue orders and other things. So if internal auditors had got any kind of a red flagging kind of a thing or other things or other controls, wherein they could have detected that how these orders are coming, why these orders are coming, maybe there could be a, could have been a possibility of eliminating this kind of a scam. So coming to the last part, uh, part of the discussion today, I'll quickly share a few fraud uh, examples in Indian perspective. These are in the news. And uh, I'll not go into the individual details again. These, these are only for just for the understanding what are the uh, what fraud can be prevented, how fraud can be prevented, and what we what should be the audit approach. So Satyam computer scam, auditor could have been more diligent. There were punishments to the auditors also. And what was what I feel in my personal judgment, I feel the auditors could have been more independent and more vigilant. PNB scam, LOUs were given without adequate collateral securities. So lack of uh, good controls. Uh, there were internal controls which were vitiated. System was overridden and all these things led to various kind of undue advantage given to the customers in collusion with the bank officials and internal auditors did not have the adequate techniques to detect that. Similarly, a recent is ILFS scandal, wherein debt obligations could not be met. And this was not over one year. This was over a few years or some years. So when it was there, the internal auditors had a sufficient, or maybe I feel they could have, or they could have interrogated to find out why the situation is going from bad to worse. Maybe there were some red flags that could have come to their mind which could have influenced their controls or their testing, or maybe uh, asking the, the management to uh, go for some kind of investigation to look into it and reduce the impact or maybe totally eliminate such kind of a fraud. So Kingfisher Airlines again, so the internal auditor would have scrutinized the financial statements better and the fraud maybe could have been detected earlier or maybe eliminated as well. I'm not going into the individual details. So when we talk of all these things, the perspective of the management, 
the approach of the internal auditor, the interplay between the management, the internal auditor, the approach, and the fraud prevention measures, all these things when we took uh, look together, what we find that the management has to be strong enough to have a proper policy code in place. It should authorize, it should give responsibilities to the appropriate people or committees to set up important plans, designs, and other things. Once these are duly set up, these are appropriately handled by the internal audit for monitoring the, their effectiveness and their working. Once that is done, if, if there are any uh, anything which is not according to the rules or which is giving some other kind of a red flag or indication or surety of a fraud happening, it should be properly reported to the management along with the recommendation, remedial measures, and the insights for the management to ensure the compliance with the overall objective of the management. With this, I would like to conclude my discussion so far, and I'm open to take care of the questions that may be coming up. So how do we really go on it? Uh, can I stop share the screen, please? Yes, you can uh, stop share the screen and maybe we can look at a question answer if you have already received. Can we just go through a Q&A &A tab? So someone will be reading out the questions. I am not having it there right away. Okay. Uh, my counsel colleague Gautam is there and uh, uh, Gautam, can you please see if, uh, because I just joined, so if you're able to see the Q&A tab and... and then... by I... Sure. I don't think so. Uh, there are any questions. I can't find any questions in Q&A. Uh, Mishra maybe, ji, maybe, any maybe, questions? Maybe, maybe I have explained it so good or maybe I have been totally... <laughs> matlab, ek dam bimar chala gaya. Sir ke upar se nikal gaya. Nay, sir, nay, I think... nay, sir, you have explained really well. Yes, exactly. I am sure the participants, whoever had any queries, you have already addressed them through your presentation. That might be the only reason that we are not getting any questions. Uh, I don't think so. We have any questions. Uh, uh, I, have one, I have one question from my side, sir. Yeah, please go ahead. Sir, this forensic uh, is a very new growing opportunity for all of us. And uh, uh, there is a lot of discussion and debate with respect to the role of auditor. And uh, we have been talking, uh, we learned earlier that the auditor is watchdog, then bloodhound. Now, I don't know whether as an intern auditor, what is the expectation of the government? Because management expects that being an intern auditor, you should be able to go through in every smallest aspect. And if the fraud occurs, they first pinpoint to intern auditor, say that, why, what have you done? After that, they go to such auditor, what you've done. So, in my view, the intern auditor's role has been more crucial because if the fraud has occurred and if the intern auditor has failed to identify fraud, then there will be a lot of backlashes on the intern auditor's shoulder. So, what should be the role of intern in this situation? So, uh, very nice question, Chintan. I would like to just uh, expand it further. So, we are talking about role of internal auditor role of the investigator, role of the forensic auditor, role of the statutory auditor, and role of the management. As I mentioned earlier during my discussion, the primarily, uh, primary responsibility of fraud prevention lies with the management and those charged with the mm -hmm. governance. They are duly assisted by the internal auditor in ensuring that whatever plans they have uh, uh, put in place, they are effectively put in uh, working and in case any anomalies or differences or any fraud has been found by them, those are duly taken care of. So control and control mechanism, these are reviewed by the internal auditor. So And they also look into the fraud risk factors also. So there they need to understand. What also needs to be understand is coming it to, taking it to the second level, investigation officers within the company. So they will be more specialized to look into what went wrong. Then there is a forensic audit, which is a specialized kind of an assignment, which the management or some other entity puts on the uh, corporate because they have been bereft of certain advantage, certain benefits that they should duly have got 
So since they have not got, they have put on a forensic audit, like the banks putting on the companies. So that kind, that is what is forensic audit and statutory audit. They again have a reporting role that management is primarily responsible. And when they are conducting the audit as per essence, there may be chances of these may not be detected at the time of audit. So this interplay is important. Internal auditor, yes, it, it is part of the management. So it, it should really not be compared into the with the forensic audit. We are where they are going like a what? Uh, uh, they are going just to with the intention of finding out the uh, the fraud. Their, their objective is yes, something is wrong. Internal auditor comes, something may go wrong. So that is the basic difference between the two. Sir, I hope I'm able you, to clarify. Yes, Anything sir. sir you, yeah, you have rightly pointed out the differences which have been theoretical written and which we understand a concept. But when fraud really happens, then no one is able to look at these theoretical differences. Uh, because fraud is factor identification is a part of intro exercise. It is part of risk control matrix also. It is also part of the security exercise. So then whenever if something happens, these all things are not looked into. What is being expected that as an auditor, you should have done it. And then, then comes a picture where uh, the standard of auditing, interest of auditing, all has been shown with line tool by line to intro auditor and such auditor why this particular line has not been followed. So at that time, the, this conceptual clarity is there in our mind, but it is not being practically effective nowadays in the last five years. So with NAFRA and all these things coming in, the role of internal auditors, the role of statutory auditors and the forensic auditors and everything will be more clear to the professionals. They will be knowing <laughs> where the line is drawn and what to do, what not to do, what to speak, what not to speak, where to speak, not what, where not to speak, what to push back to the management and ensure that the management takes the responsibility where it is really required of them and not uh, shy, uh, shy away from that. Exactly. So I think the, what is expected from us that we have to be, uh, even though our role is such a or intro -writer, we need to really go at a lot of depth and then get assurance on, uh, like it's not reasonable assurance, it's not limited assurance, it is like extensive assurance on the financial uh, figures backed with the documentation that we have complied with all regulations. Documentation it's, is always important. Documentation <laughs> is the only lifesaver. Documentation, uh, no. say, say, say no, no compromise on documentation. You have to start from the planning to the designing, to the implementation, to the recommendations, to reporting. Everything has to be properly documented. There we have to uh, indicate very clearly. We have applied professional skepticism. We have uh, done our role. We have assessed the risks. Those risks were duly addressed. Designs were made. Effectiveness was checked. Then... Uh, Review was carried out. Whatever was noted was duly pointed out and accordingly. Absolutely. I think the what is being always said, uh, there is no documentation, no work done. And that's the essence of today's uh, thing. And we need to be really uh, meticulously planning the work and ensuring it is being available. So with this brief word, sir, thank you so much. And I request <laughs> Gautam by uh, my council colleague, who is a very young dynamic, and uh, to offer a word of thanks. Thank you, Chintan Bhai. Uh, let me first wish you everyone a very happy Dosera. Uh, you know, I can see participants are attending uh, on an occasion of Dosera. That itself shows that, uh, you know, what is the quality of speakers and quality of content we are having. Uh, before going to vote of thanks, let me congratulate Chintan Bhai, you know, for this wonderful show. You know, I have uh, got a response from multiple participants, you know, excellent structure and, uh, you know, very learned speakers. Uh, sir, uh, you know, uh, you have very well explained uh, the management approach, the role of auditor, internal auditor, uh, and the approach of the auditor, management expectations, management perspective, putting into Ramayana in the picture, and then, you know, international perspective, then national perspective, you know, I am sure all of us who are attending this uh, uh, webinar today, we are taking a great learning home. Thank you so much for, you know, sharing your experiences, sir, and for this wonderful enriching session. Thank you so much from on behalf of WIRC. With your permission, I would uh, like to thank uh, CA Ansul Agarwal, CA Nikunj Bhualka, and uh, CA B. Karunakar Rao, who during the last two days of holidays have worked on this presentation to be made. 
and put before all this wonderful audience that you have uh, given before me. Thank you so much. Thank you all of you. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. So much, it's a pleasure to have you, sir, today. Thank you. Gautam, we can take next uh, session immediately. Sure, I can see Aditya. Uh, Jaikin? Uh, yeah, Jaikin is there. Jaikin yes. is there. And Mr. Uh, Mr. Abhilash Brahmin. Hello. Okay, I can see now. Uh, okay, cool. Should we start, sir? Yes, please. So, let me introduce our today's moderator. Uh, you know, of the panel discussion as moderator's role is really difficult because he need to ask the tough questions because the better questions will be, we will be expecting better answers and he need to really extract the answers and the experiences from the uh, panelist. So our moderator for the day is C.A. Jaikin Shah. He is an MSc FCA DISA. You know, it's a strange combination that he is a MSc states and then he, uh, you know, a uh, Chartered accountant, I would like to, you know, sir, uh, really strange combination I am seeing. Uh, he is practicing in the name of Rajendra Jesha and company. He is a Bachelor of Science from 2005 with gold medal in statistics. Uh, then he is a Master of Science in 2007 in statistics. A Chartered Accountant of 2011 batch awarded gold medal for securing highest mark in direct tax. So a gold medalist in BSc and a gold medalist in Chartered Accountancy. Then he's a DISA qualified. He successfully completed certificate course for concurrent audit. He has been nominated member of Direct Tax Committee of WIRC of ICI. And he is part of various committees of Ahmedabad uh, branch of WIRC. With this brief introduction, we welcome you, sir. Over to you, Jaikin Bhai. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gautam Bhai. Thank you, Chintan Bhai, for giving me this opportunity to become a moderator for this panel discussion. I know it's going to be a little bit tough because the faculties are so much learned faculty. So to uh, find out the tough question is a really tough task. <laughs> because no questions will be tough for them. Yes, so uh, let me introduce our uh, uh, panelist. First, uh, C. Abhilash Shri Brahmin. He is a uh, BCom and FCA. Is right now partner in JK Brahmin and Company. His family firm in practice for more than 38 years. Firm was established in 1985. He has passed uh, CA in 1998 and he is in practice uh, since last 25 years. His area of practice are internal audit, due diligence, business consultancy, and transaction advisory. He was a general secretary in HL College of Commerce in year 93 94, selected on merit basis. He is visiting faculty at IECFAI, Ahmedabad chapter, imparting training of financial accountancy subject uh, to MBA students. So with this uh, brief introduction, let us welcome C. Abhilash Ramin, sir. Thank you. Our second panelist is C. A. Aditya Jain, sir. He is a chartered accountant with experience of more than a decade in governance, risk, and compliance. He is leading the management assurance function for Arvind Group, dealing in textile, garmenting, retail, heavy engineering, and real estate. His prior experience is with Big Four, is providing research advisory services to clients in manufacturing segments, such as oil and gas, cement engineering, and service segment, such as logistics, medical. He has been involved in the various assignments which required providing clients with proactive insights related to fraud indicators, red flags, and its mitigation plan, so which is uh, right now our today's topic, how to prevent the fraud. He has also assisted client in conducting investigation around procurement, supply chain, sales, and human resource related frauds. He is dedicated to promoting ethical business practice and has a keen interest in advancing the field of auditing and financial governance to create more resilient and trustworthy organization. So with this brief introduction, let us welcome CA Aditya Jain, sir. And Thank our you. third Thank panelist you. is CA, uh, CMA Sachin Aroskar. So, uh, Sachin Araskar, sir, is a commerce graduate from University of Bombay and caution management accountant. He is also successfully completed on a campus management development program for working professional from IIM Bangalore. He has done certification program in hydrocarbon accounting and assurance from an internal oil and gas training institute based out of Abraded in Scotland. Sachin is a qualified and experienced finance professional specializing in internal audit. 
and risk management with expertise in assurance of oil and gas, real estate and manufacturing industry. He has over a 29 years of practical industry experience, predominating in the GRS domain. In addition, he has also performed as head commercial in the past, providing complete finance and commercial support at a senior level of a group of overseas hydrocarbon exploration assets under company operatorship. At present, he is executive vice president and head internal audit at the Loda Group, which is a listed company under real estate development domain. At present, MDL is one of the largest real estate developer in India by residential estate. And his uh, earlier experience includes seven years at SR Group, corporate as well as SR Energy, and more than eight years at Reliance Industry Limited. So with this uh, introduction, let us welcome CMS Sachin Aruskar, sir. So welcome all the panelists. So uh, let us start our uh, discussion on this uh, today's topic. So we'll start with uh, CMS Sachin Aruskar, sir. So our uh, today's tagline topic that how to prevent uh, the fraud and how to detect the fraud. So as per uh, you, according to you, what role with the auditor can play in the detection and prevention of the fraud with the help of internal audit? Can you give some uh, brief and highlights on how we can do this, how we can achieve this? Sir, you're on a uh, mute. It will be on the left side of the screen downward. Right. Um, thank you. Am I, am I audible to you all? Yes. Uh, so thanks, uh, uh, Jackin Mai, for, for a good introduction. Um, very kind words from you. And uh, basically, happy Dashera to everyone. Right. Uh, before we start this discussion, um, let me uh, know the uh, accountants, chartered accountants, cost accountants like disclaimers. So let me start with a disclaimer that whatever we are going to speak, and at least I'm going to speak, is going to be uh, my personal opinion. Um, and I, by no way, uh, represent the corporate opinion of my current or my uh, past uh, employers. So, so with that, uh, let's start uh, the discussion. So the question put um, to the panel and me in particular is, uh, how do we detect and prevent frauds through internal audit? Uh, in order that the discussion becomes, because my entire experience has been practical experience on the industry, on the manufacturing, on the ground zero. So whatever I'm going to speak, I'm going to speak through uh, through uh, examples, and uh, I'll I'll make sure that the examples do not directly reflect the industry that I have worked for, but basically they will help us know um, what we have done right and sometimes what we have done wrong. Also. Because uh, anybody who tries to do something will eventually make a mistake. Mistakes is a great uh, things to learn, right? So, uh, so in my limited view and experience, uh. We do not start to find or detect fraud as we start to roll our overall internal assurance program. At least I do not approach the task like that. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the traditional uh, literature and the mandate given to the internal audit, the internal assurance, fraud detection has not been a first mandate for so many years. However, with the with the more and more expectations of the current management in a practical and in a uh, corporate world, it is expected from the internal auditors, which is typically at the LOD level, works at LOD 2 or LOD 3 at times, that they should at least create an environment and a, create a mechanism, internal control system, which will give early signals, which will give a red flags, as we all call it, if there is problem. So the intention is to create and design the internal audit program and to design the internal control mechanism of which we are a living body. And also to, to create our internal financial controls program, the IFC program, which, which most of us think is the is a standard routine to be done once or twice a year. But basically to to put through these three uh, I would say check post, a detailed internal audit program. An internal control mechanism, which is basically a common total of checks and balances, 
uh, a properly defined uh, delegation of authorities, processes, procedures, guidelines, and policies, and the well woven internal financial controls, which can considers all kinds of risks that the management faces. If these three check posts work together and they work as a whole with synergistic effect, most of the frauds, I would repeat, most of the frauds will some way or the other proliferate before they happen at the full scale. Uh, one example uh, as to how do we try to do it. So first and foremost, we look at where our organization is going in the next year because internal audit plan is a yearly yearly exercise so i when i draw the plan in the month of jan to february for the next april to be started i first look at what my organization's objectives are for the next year and what is different from the last year so that where i do have to do a tweaking to think that this area needs to be looked at uh, a broader detail to give you an example if we decide that next year we are going to do more of the JDA program, the joint development agreements rather than uh, doing development on our own land, then I look what different we are going to do. We are going to deal with other developers who are landowners. Then we are going to basically have a quick due diligence because these have to be done at a speed. So a quick due diligence is done by the business development team and a decision and a transaction is struck with full information not in place. So when we typically go and do the screening of, of those JDAs, what we look at is basically where are the where are the risks where some of the high level risks either are not brought to the surface or are intelligently hidden. This is this is this example tells you that that what what would be different from the current year. Another standard and simple thing is is, is looking at the data, the same data which your company generates in a different manner every time. If you know how to read the data and understand it and interpret it, data all the time tells you a lot of information. Basically, four, four things. Uh, your PRPO release structure, your uh, work certi certification part where you do the SCS or JRN in SAP uh, parlance, you do your invoice verification, and you do the payment. This data is entirely available if you work on SAP or Oracle Financial. This data is available in your system. Do a simple VLOOKUP and just, I'm, I'm coming at ground zero because that's how I said, uh, I'll give you practical examples, otherwise the discussion becomes very theoretical. Always look at how quickly a PRPO release versus work certification versus invoice verification is happening. If they are if these things are happening much faster, then they should normally take the time. It gives you a hint that someone is actually managing the entire process very fast than it normally in a national balance. So these are a couple of examples given. Always keep your eyes open because frauds are perpetrated by people who know the system pretty well. Who know that there is a strong governance system, especially in the listed entities where I've been working for the last 22 years. Listed entities are, are prepared with technology, good experience and people. Inside this environment, when frauds happen, the, the the individual or the group of individuals are prepared. They know that they are going to get caught. Hence, they are those those are not mistakes or those are not. So, when you are trying to arrest those kind of frauds, your your testing mechanism or your figuring out mechanism has also to be equally sophisticated. It has to be a little step ahead. But mind you, despite doing all of that. There would be frauds happening. There'll, there'll be cases of frauds ultimately happening of smaller or, or sometimes larger issues. However, you will, you will still be supported and not held responsible, provided you demonstrated, and as the earlier speaker, the learned guy said, through documentation and through your designs, that you had the mechanism ready to identify those kind of frauds, those kind of risk areas and those kind of red flags. You will be considered professionally appropriate at work because you have done enough to identify and, and early detect the fraud to the extent possible. I'll stop at this uh, for the time. Any specific question, I would be happy to answer. Sure. Uh, thank you, Sachin Bhai.
it's a very insightful thoughts and insightful uh, your practical experience that uh, auditor always should keep their eyes and ears open what's happening around them and what uh, talkings are going on because so many clues are uh, we will get from uh, uh, seeing around only and uh, also we should uh, generalize the data and we should very carefully stick to the data because uh, many things are in there only data is only it is our master guide that what is happening and what we should uh, try to avoid and what we should uh, give more focus. So uh, thank you for your practical uh, experience. Now let me ask a question to see Aditya Jain sir. Sir, uh, you are the uh, heading head the management assurance department in your company. So I think you are better familiar with the expectation of the management from internal auditor for this uh, prevention and detection of the fraud. So can you give some brief on the those topics that uh, what are the major expectations for a management and what they are exactly expecting from internal auditor? Because as an okay. internal auditor, uh, initially we are giving the scope that you have to do this and this and this. And uh, at large, at large, when uh, anything happens, the role becomes uh, so larger that it was not there in the scope. So if a auditor would uh, know the uh, know, only expectations that what a management exactly expects, then he can perform his duty very well. So, sir, please uh, give some brief on that. Right. Sure. So, you know, in, um, I'd like to first emphasize that today, today's environment, you know, no management likes surprises to come up. You know, suddenly anything of a huge quantum comes up, it becomes a surprise. And then no management is, you know, in the acceptance mode of these kind of aspects. And thus those outbursts do come, you know, in the practical situations for uh, us as in professional or individuals. So for this, you know, aspect, as Sachin also mentioned and previously we have discussed, the assessment part is very much critical and very much important for us. And when I talk specifically about the assessment, it starts from the day one when the planners, plans have been drawn. So, um, you know, drawing those plans very critically, ensuring that we have involved all the important stakeholders in the organization while drawing up those plans, because that's where major of the inputs do come in for, uh, you know, us as a professional. So what are the business developments, how we are, you know, bringing those uh, agility into our internal audit plans, focusing on very granular aspects of the business that is, you know, developing or changing around us. Because these days, you know, there are a lot of geopolitical factors which do play a lot of vital importance for us as an organization. So, uh, you know, the important aspect is how we look into these aspects, then, you know, do the risk assessment. And then hand in hand draw our audit plan. And then definitely adhering to the execution of those plans is equally important. So for say, you know, any organization with deals into exporting of goods, specifically to say US, Europe, or uh, then the underdeveloped countries like Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka has been through crisis. Then what kind of strategy is organization going to adopt in say exporting the goods to Sri Lanka, how they are going to secure their finances, how they are going to, you know, deal with this kind of thing. So audit has to be agile and incorporating all these aspects, you know, parallelly in all these aspects. So thus the assessment is very much important. That's what, you know, management expects us to inculcate into our audit plan. So first is a, you know, assessment. The second is awareness, how the awareness is being created into the organization. For all the code of conduct related aspects, the whistleblower programs, how are the employees being made aware of these aspects, which is very critical today because, you know, the code of conduct becomes the guiding principle for any employee coming into the organization It clearly spills out the do's and don'ts. So highlighting if the gaps are there and advising management on to how the effectiveness of these programs can be improved into the organization is really, very important. Frauds, you know, we most of the time think through from a perspective that uh, employees are involved, but in today's world, the third party frauds are also equally, you know, being uh, important in today's scenario because we deal with a lot of third parties. So those third parties, how contractually the organization is, you know, safeguarding themselves so that if there is any fraud conducted by a third party, how our liability is limited, how the organization is getting indemnified towards it, it's an important aspect. So these are all from the preventive aspects, uh, aspects I was talking about when it comes to assessment, when it uh, you know comes to spreading awareness into the organization or from the contractual aspects. Equally, when you know the detective aspect comes into play, I guess uh, over there, you know, post, if there is any fraud or any aspect has been uh, identified, 
the investigation part so you know there can be two roles of an uh, internal auditor into it either into support or either you know he has been interested with the responsibility of conducting the investigations himself it has happened in past that you know the role has been provided because internal auditor knows the organization well he knows you know the flow of data he knows the systems so it has been you know seen that many times uh, they have been interested with this responsibility so how he ensures that the entire end to end conduct of this investigation is done in a proper manner also ensuring that there is no retaliation towards the person who has been you know uh, the complainant in this aspect and also ensuring that the fair inquiry is conducted and all the facts are disclosed and when i talk about facts it's from the two perspectives one is identifying the quantum and second you know the level at which it has been spread across the organization so that becomes very important you know for management to know and that's the expectation that they have and also from regulatory point of view how the disclosures are to be done is something you know management expects us to guide them and definitely post you know all these things have been detected detected and you know investigations have been completed then implementation ensuring that the implementation is taking place for all such gaps and the actions you know which the uh, management has decided against those individuals are completed in a time bound manner so that you know all these things are plugged and the recurrence is not then happening so from the detective and the preventive perspective these have been the you know expectations of the management um with whom i have dealt in uh, you know my experience till date and these are the limited ones but yeah it depends on you know different uh cases or the you know highlights which come across so i will take a pause and you know would want to answer any specific questions that come across sir sir thank you very much for presenting your views and the uh, knowledge about the expectation of the management about the quantum about the preventive actions and how we can uh, work as a supportive role or detective role so yeah uh, thank you now uh, let me ask question to see abhilash ramin sir yes, sir if uh, we auditor are uh, find some discrepancy which is uh, duly approved by the senior professional to move on and uh, with the same but being an auditor so discrepancy are of such importance which in our opinion should be brought to the management's uh, knowledge board's knowledge so how to move ahead with this kind of situation first of all happy to say that to all of you happy see that. when whenever the discrepancies come first of all if discrepancy is detected by internal auditor first assess it very independently what the kind of discrepancy it is because in smaller organizations like in listed companies there the hierarchies are very clear in smaller organizations such discrepancies have very smaller impact or it may have a larger impact at a later point of time tomorrow it may not have a much impact today in today's scenario but considering it tomorrow's impact it will have a larger impact so first assess properly whether what is the this kind of discrepancy it is and then decide at which level it has to be properly reported first of all reporting has to be done to the board of directors or audit committee as the case may be but in smaller companies like a partnership firm llp where you have not a very structured organization because this the problem is with all smes when you perform the internal audit of smes you don't have all these proper structures internal auditor is considered as part and parcel even though he may be external agents he is assigned such a task he is advisor he is auditor like so sometimes role is not very clear scope is sometimes subdued your scope is not very clear what you were taught what you were told to do and what you were actually doing sometimes there is no match between the two but you have to balance it out so whenever a discrepancy is there assess its impact and then report at a proper level i am i am giving you few examples what kind of discrepancies practically we have noticed during the course of our audit let's say in a payroll processing see in bigger companies you have biometrics you may have uh, face recognition but in still smaller companies you have a card card punching till today also like where the employees are 500 700 there still card punching is there now hr executive was very smart employees who were exited he was not marking them as an exit he he retained the cards with him and every day 
he just punches out in the morning and punch out in the evening and just done a payroll fraud now this kind of discrepancy is when you notice you have to immediately inform the management about the change because now technology has changed you cannot continue with this this is not a costlier affair in terms of change but this is a costlier affair in terms of the fraud yes so this is very important this is in a smaller organization you have lot of challenges because management even not accept many things when you want to implement it in terms of technology they are not well equipped they always resist ke boss iska kya zarurat hai yaar kar denge baad mein abhi kya karna hai aap chalao isse hi chalao abhi so we have lot of challenges we cannot even share the proper planning to them they are always saying yaar karo abhi to aapko audit karna hai aapko hi ye sab dekhna hai you look at it so there is not a clear bifurcation of this so whenever you detect a fraud even when you report the fraud they do not take you very seriously also reason being risk of reputation damage are yaar mere wahan fraud ho gaya ye market mein pata chalega to mere reputation ka kya hoga this is a common answer you will get ki yaar kuch karo isko chodo abhi jo ho gaya so ho gaya chalo aage badhte even they don't bother to take suggestive action also ke boss isko implement karo aage se nahi ho gaya even they they don't bother so you have to be very affirmative and as the sir faculty sir has pointed out documentation because tomorrow if fir is there everyone will ask auditor kya karta hai so everyone will look upon you yaar aapko ye pata tha so have you reported now to whom reported i have because there is no formal channel of communication you meet the owner every day you have already told him but formal reporting is must whenever you find a fraud make it very clear send an email to him that this is my finding and this is a possible fraud and this is a possible impact so tomorrow you will be safe if you won't properly communicate it even even a first line of defense second line of defense some senior executive may not be very keen are sir hai chalo theek hai baad mein dekhenge this may be very very uh, problematic at a later point of time so always be affirm in your reporting that's my suggestion yeah thank you abhilash bhai you have rightly pointed out the documentation part because anything that can save us is only documentation that uh, we have documented that and we have vouched for that we have informed the management and that ultimate decision was lying upon the management that what to do what not to do as your example that uh, punching of card and uh, as rightly mentioned by sachin bhai that uh, uh, detect uh, assess the data if we find the all the punching time every day and punch out time If we can easily uh, trigger it out that there might be something wrong because each and every employee how they are coming at the same time and how they are going at exactly the same time. So it it is the pain point that something is wrong and we have to trigger that. Okay, so thank you very much for your views. Now yes, uh, again uh, Sachin Bhai, uh, I have a question for you that uh, can you say uh, share some practical instances which you have might come across in your company or anywhere else. that uh, which were not easily be qualify as a fraud but it was actually planned systematic fraud which uh, with naked eyes you can uh, say no it is nothing let it go kuch nahi hai chalo jaane dete kuch nahi but jab usko pura detect karte dissect karte hai to hame pata chalta hai nahi ye to pura systematic fraud ho chuka hai aur kisi ko pata bhi nahi chal raha hai abhi jaisa kai baar hua tha ki ek aadmi ne bank se paise nikale paise nikale paise nikale बट जब काउंटिंग का टाइम आ रहा था तो वापस उसने अंदर डाल दिए थे तो किसी को पता नहीं चला कि बीच में जो ड्यूरिंग दैट पीरियड जो पीरियड था वहां पे उतने टाइम पे लिए वहां पे पैसे थे ही नहीं सो इट वाज एक्चुअली अ फ्रॉड बट नॉट अ क्वालिफाइंग फ्रॉड सो प्लीज कैन यू गिव सम एग्जांपल्स और सिचुएशन व्हिच यू माइट हैव कम अक्रॉस यस आई शुड गिव टू डिफरेंट एग्जांपल्स एंड बोथ हैव बीन सीन पर्सनली बाय मी व्हिच for a long time uh, were not seen as as something which was a systemic uh, wrong doing but when when detected the full size came out so again i am not giving any reference to any particular thing but but uh, the example is and it will surprise you as to what we think small many a times the devil lies in the detail uh, one of my gurus in this profession 30 years ago he taught me that we all have been taught that the god lies in detail 
But please understand for auditors, the devil shows his ugly face when you go into the detail. So uh, one example is uh, when your business is doing extremely well and when, for example, your bottom line, your top line is growing very fast, your organization generally becomes a little more uh, accept, acceptable towards higher expenditure. Because for the MD, for the CFO, the, the, the typical calculation is what is my cost of sales? What is my channel cost? If, if my sales is 10,000 crores and my overall channel costs are sitting, I mean, apart from the direct expenditure, overall channel costs are in the 3 to 4 percentage, then they are okay because traditionally they are seeing my channel costs are 7, 8 percent, they are coming down. But 3 percent of 10,000 crores is 300 crores. In absolute terms, it's a lot of money. So the first example I'm, I'm giving is, uh, this is many years ago, and hence some amount of pooling has happened over it. Uh, our business in, in real estate, when we launch a project, as part of various multi-dimensional uh, promotions. One promotion, many years uh, used. Nowadays, it has been completely changed by, by digital media. But there was a time when we used to send a lot of SMSs. At times, so many that the buyers or non-buyers used to get irritated because they'll get. So, so uh, again, giving an example, we were looking. I was personally looking at the SMS data through various... Um, service providers for last four years uh, from a particular year back four years now any of you know who know that how this sms business works you have you have telecom companies you have try at the top then you have telecom companies who have licenses circle licenses from them and then there are individual operators who buy a bulk amount for the professional i mean they have the licenses to give the professional uh, promotion uh, particular amount of uh, SMSs they can generate and they can use it through the individual service providers. Now those rates, those times, used to be between 2 paise per SMS to 7 paise per SMS. Yeah, Who's who's supplying it to us? And ultimately, with all the channel costs, my, my cost of SMS typically comes at 8 to 10 paise per SMS that I'm sending it to the customer. Obviously, it, it sounds to me as a, as a cheapest and the most economical uh, aspect. Now, when I looked at four years data and I focused because the data was humongous, then I focused it, I, I, I funneled it down to three projects in Thani. Uh, we have, as a developer, we have a huge uh, uh, concentration and a huge market share in Thani. So there were three big townships we were developing in Thani and we, I looked at that data. I came to know that on those three projects, I have spent over four years, 1.5 crores, 3.5 crores, 6.5 crores, and 9.5 crores going up. The SMS cost was 8 paise in the last year when I spent 9.5 crores. A simple mathematics tells me that for 9.5 crores I spent 8 paise per SMS, I had sent more than 100 crore SMSs in a year for three developments. Then, then the mathematics was not fitting in. Then I did some more simple mathematical analysis saying that how many people did receive those messages? Because India ke abadi 150-140 crore hai. Usme se those who can buy houses are not more than 20-25 crores. Usme se in Thane, in a particular pocket near Mumbai, what is going to be the size of the, the home buyers? And how many messages are we sending them? I mean, the data spoke to us. We didn't do much. Once the data became fully profluent, I just I just took it to the CSO, the chief sales officer, and said, Sir, what have you done in your last year? In three projects, you have sent 107 crore messages, SMSs, and you have sent 8 rates. You have sent the total cost of 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 the आपने 107 करोड़ मैसेज किसको भेजे आपके लोगों ने किसको भेजे यू आल्सो गॉट परप्लेक्स्ड ही ही इज वन हुज हुज अ हुज अ स्मार्ट गाय हु हुज ऑन टॉप ऑफ नंबर्स बिकॉज़ ही इज वी वी आर सेल्स पर एनम इज क्लोज टू 15000 करोड़ ऑन अ डेली बेसिस वी सेल वी सेल फास्टर देन पीपल सेल कार्स और हाउसेस टर्न फास्टर सो सो देन वंस आई शोड द प्रॉब्लम टू हिम ही वाज फ्लैबगास्टेड रेस्ट इज हिस्ट्री देन वी सिस्टमेटिकली came down, we found out and ultimately the story unfolds like this, that 
for for three four years a group of salesmen who thought that the cost of smss was below the radar because there are other costs you know i am hiring the advertising agencies i am hiring the promotional agencies i am doing events i am doing channel partner meets all of this i am doing the cost of which is far more than 7 8 crores because my sales is 10000 crores at this tiny number and for for years so they had got those three four three four uh, aggregators sms aggregators who managed without sending any messages who managed to do the entire number because when then i ask for the full details i want to see which are the numbers to which these messages because i was sure that there are there, there are not more than 100 crore numbers individual numbers of mobiles in this particular region so then then funny things came out a mobile having 11 digits a landline as a mobile the same mobile having been sent 302 messages in a day then we defined a crack team and i myself anonymously called that person and said sir my amuk amuk company se bol raha hu that person started blasting me then there maine number badalwa diya aapke yahan se kitne messages aate so so at the expense that we were doing we were not creating sales we were creating the detestment in the mind of people so not only from the money part of it we were we were actually completely derailing the campaign uh happy to told that when this happened our entire system got uh, sort of shaken up a few people lost their jobs the service providers were blacklisted and from 9.5 crores that year the next year's sms expenditures were 70000 70 lakh rupees 9.4 to 70 lakhs anybody who wanted to ask for more than 10 lakh rupees worth of smss would shiver before going to the cso because it became a bad word sms became a bad word and eventually not only that the, the entire company thought that this is this is the crude way and the oldest way a fraud prone way to do to promotion let us think of better ways let us engage the four best platforms nowadays where the entire sales happen insta facebook uh, a part of linkedin without telling that you are doing advertisement on linkedin and uh, of course uh, the other aspects of uh, influencers what i'm trying to tell you is this is the power of bringing something which is looking small to the management which can have a big impact and and not only this they entirely change the approach of how they want to approach. this is the first example the second example i'll give where where we change the design so that the chances of fraud come down uh, again, as a large real estate developer, our direct employment is about 4,000 plus people. But indirectly, we employ through third party more than 50,000 laborers who work on our more than 50 sites at any point of time. So it is practically, and and you know, the most of these laborers are, are ground level turners, fitters, the construction workers, the unskilled, semi-skilled gangs with whom uh, most of the attendance detection mechanisms don't work. I mean, you'll be surprised to know that most of their people's uh, thumb impressions don't work because they have worked so much with uh, with uh, brick and mortar do that their, their, uh, the, the skin impressions don't work. Face recognition is very difficult to, to put uh, on because I am an industry where my factory changes every four or five years. So the permanent detection mechanisms are not possible to be installed on my construction sites. So what typically used to happen, any mechanism which tries to pay attendance basis, there would definitely be a certain amount of fraud. The service provider would try to bring in 5 to 10% extra labor or try to bring or bill 5 to 10% extra labor and this is pretty impossible to detect and cut down. So this we brought at the design level and said that entire, entire third party construction part has to be BUA basis, built up area basis, rather than effort basis. I'm paying for per square feet of construction. I'm paying for per square meter of waterproofing. I'm paying for per square meter or per square feet of facade design. I'm not paying you for the efforts that you put. I'm paying you for the outcome. The fraud vanished. Now, now from 10% more number, now there are 10% less number of people because now the productivity has become not my worry, the contractors worry. This is an area where there were frauds happening for a long period, 
but by changing the design to output basis rather than input basis, we not only reduce the fraud, the, we eliminate the fraud, but we improve the productivity on the contractor basis and then we improve his rates also. He said, Aap itna kaam itne samay mein kar do. Ye rate hai aapka. Aapka manpower abhi kam ho raha hai. So per manpower aapko rate jada milega. So obviously aapka output cost aur uske upar kya profit element badega. Second example. Third example where typically in real estate uh, the frauds happen is any activity for which the subsequent measurement is difficult. One very good example is excavation and entire substructure activity. There was a very famous movie which calls What Lies Beneath. So what lies beneath is typically not seen by the naked eye. So when you are constructing, like one of our uh, developments, which is very famous in Bombay, is called World Towers. It's a 83-story uh, a group of three buildings which are more than 80 story each. Those buildings look fantastic, but what is more fantastic to me is how they have been developed substructure. How much deep we have gone for footing? What kind of substructure we have designed so that those buildings will stand for the next 60, 70, 80 years? And what challenges we faced? Now the cost of raising such kind of a substructure can go beyond 100 crores, 120 crores, because you have to deal and negotiate with the very difficult strata. You are, you are constructing it in South Bombay, where alongside your construction boundary, there are other tall towers. You can't dig and you can't drill where those foundations are, are, are caused any problem. Under those constr uh, multiple constraints, when you do this kind of work, speed is of essence, accuracy is of essence. So there, subsequent to the work done and once you've come a level up, once you completed the piling, what was done yesterday, last month, last quarter will never be seen. And, and you can't apply your modern techniques there because it's actually construction site. So there, what we did, what is called is continuous video recording of the work done on a daily basis, continuous billing and continuous payment to eliminate the frauds which happen because it is, see there are three simple frauds. I go down 100 meter, I bill for 120 meters down. Subsequently, impossible to detect. There are four types of strata that I negotiate. Soft soil, hard soil, semi-weathered rock, hard rock, sheet rock, five types different. Sheet rock rate, as compared to the soft soil rate, can be 17 times more. So the contractors always wish is to define as much as possible something towards the hardest strata where he has not negotiated that kind of a strata. Simple things, I'm not talking uh, physics or Chandrayaan, I'm talking simple things, very effectively perpetrated because subsequently you cannot detect it. So, so we again deployed and made a senior structural engineer responsible to do it on a daily basis, report it on a daily basis, create a documentation. Again, I'll go back to the gentleman's wordings. Documentation is the key because, and, and documentation nowadays is not papers and handwritings. They are videographies with powerful cameras. Now your uh, iPhone 13 or 14 Pro gives you excellent videographical poss possibilities with turnaround cameras. Record it with full lights. Put it on a weekly basis. And typically, these kind of contractors have a habit. Most of you would have seen who have worked in the industry. You wonder because uh, at our level, if three months salary is not paid, we are wondering how will we run the houses. But these people can sustain without billing for six, seven, eight months. Because typically when they bill, as compared to what work they have done, they'll build two and a half times, three times at least. So that extra margin allows them That's to sustain. sustain for this extra time. And during this period, they have grossly over, over -built. And again, I'll go back and give the simple example that my entire construction cost is more than 1500 crores. 100 crores looks small in front of that. And time is of essence because anybody who's, who's, who's associated with real estate, time is money. How quickly you construct, how quickly, quickly you achieve the milestone, how quickly you collect the money decides how quickly you're rolling in your sales velocity, your collection velocity, and your IRR of the project. Yes, of cheese way when I'm I'm running at such a speed to complete the project, to collect the money and to come out of the project. Yeah, as we saw, 
क्योंकि ये बाद में मेजर नहीं होगा वॉट लाइज बिनीथ स्टेज बिनीथ वॉन्स इट इज कवर्ड बाई द नेक्स्ट लेवल ऑफ कल्चर आई होप आई आई बीन एबल टू मेक इट रेलिवेंट एंड वेरी प्रैक्टिकल अगेन स्पेसिफिक क्वेश्चन ऑफलाइन ऑनलाइन आई एम हैप्पी टू आंसर थैंक यू Thank you, Sachin. Bhai. It was really a uh, eye-opening that uh, generally we are going for only broad view, and we are ignoring the micro views. So this is the best examples which you have given. If choti cheese, if we ignore it, then we get more fraud. We get more fraud. So yes, uh, thank you. Now, again, uh, same type of question to Mr. Aditya Jain. अभी ये जो बात हुई हमारी दैट वाज द फ्रॉड व्हिच यू हैव कम अक्रॉस और व्हिच आर हैपन इन द पास्ट और व्हिच आर व्हिच मे बी द ओल्ड पैटर्न टू मेक द फ्रॉड नाउ टुडे सिनेरियो इज आर्टिफिशियल इंटेलिजेंस सो इन एआई सिनेरियो व्हाट कैन बी द प्रैक्टिकल प्रॉब्लम्स एंड व्हाट कुड बी द प्रिवेंशन दैट वी शुड कीप इन द माइंड टू अवॉइड सच टाइप ऑफ फ्रॉड्स बिकॉज़ नाउ अ डे इज वी हैव सीन दैट इंडिया इज अ वेरी हाई नंबर फॉर So, uh, online fraud and uh, online attacks, cyber threats. So, how to prevent those type of frauds, and how to take the measures to avoid such type of frauds in our organization, in any organization through our internal audit? Please give some guidance okay. on those uh, aspect. Sure. In in this aspect, you know, I would like to take a step back and emphasis again on one of the very key important aspect, which is risk assessment. When we talk about risk assessment, it is now. you know i would say no longer an activity which is to be performed once in a year twice in a year that scenario has been left back individuals you know who are uh, responsible for governance related aspects in the organization so continuous risk assessment is very much important and when it comes to technology you know day by day the technology is evolving and you know organizations are adopting way more you know quickly and and that's where our role becomes very important so i'll you know uh, deliberate on two very specific aspects one is when anything is done within the organization jab bhi hum log koi bhi naya ek software implement karte hain organization mein so at that point in time very basic things should be looked into from the auditor's perspective i would give a very small example to it it's it's pertaining to the access rights so system ke andar jo access rights roles define karne hote hain those should be very critically looked into because if any mistake done at that level would you know be detected at a later level but till that time lot of damage would have been done and that individual may be there in the organization or may you know move out of the organization once you know he might have achieved certain numbers so you know a very practical example that uh, a person who is responsible for making you know booking of the invoice should not be interested for making the payments that's a very basic or simple step to be checked so all these kind of conflicting roles conflicting access into the systems should be avoided and it's you know the foremost thing that we should be looking as an auditor because that's that's how you know things do go wrong at a um, organization then second when we talk about the external exposure in terms of cyber threats it's it it could be you know as simple as you know there is a ransomware attack there is a phishing attack there is a malware attack which is happening there are data breaches today we also have moved from uh, you know not only on laptops but also on our mobile phones a lot of data is there onto our mobile phone which relates to the organization so you know protecting the organization's data onto the mobile phones it's very important then there is a lot of internet over things which you know we control the applications and appliances in the organization sitting at our homes through you know mobile phone so that becomes really important then the network security the it network security of the organization these all things are very much important so in this aspect we also need to ensure that you know these assessment are conducted on a very regular basis there are you know qualified people who can help us support us taking their advice on timely basis for an example calling in an ethical hacker who can try to expose your system within certain boundaries and explore whether you are susceptible to certain types of cyber threats or not that is very relevant and you know a must do thing today in our environment so that you know all those aspects which are a cyber threat for an organization can be plugged in also over here there is lot of importance on to the organization setting up the firewall systems so critically assessing the firewall parameters which have been set in the organization always re- redoing that 
implementing the right security patches into the system that becomes really very important in today's world and as as an auditor ensuring that the latest patches latest you know firewall uh, rules are been updated into the system those things are very important day by day all these aspects are also becoming critical from regulatory point of view as we have noticed that you know recently there were a lot of uh digital pro- dig- digital data protection act being uh, you know coming into place though not not notified but it also talks about a lot of practices that needs to be implemented into organization so also from an governance uh, uh, you know regulatory perspective these things are coming in place uh i would like to lay emphasis on one very critical aspect which is saas software as a service a lot of organizations are using software as a service on various aspects today so evaluating your service providers for saas model very critically getting their soc 2 soc 3 certi- certifications on hand before awarding them those works so that you know they meet certain basic standards which ensures that aap jo kaam de rahe ho wo sahi vendor ko place kar rahe ho i would like to quote a couple of examples over here so first example would be um, say i am i am uh, you know taking services of a bidding platform service provider and uh, you know i'd seen in past where these service providers do you know rig the entire pricing mechanism though you know often we think hey, anything going online having a digital platform will always have some sort of uh, you know uh, fair dealing some sort of uh, clarity online bidding ho rahi hai multiple bids are but wahan pe service provider hi ye puri practice rig kar raha hai and he is collating with vendors to rig those prices though we think that it is fair but no it's not so service provider uh, software as a service provide kar rahe hain vendors unka evaluation their evaluation is must today that's very important also when we are doing certain things as an outsource today there are lots and lots of kps on bpos who are coming up who are providing lot of accounting related services unke wahan pe kya practices hai wo evaluate karna it's also very important from technology perspective because then if any data breach happens at their end would be costing to the organization because this is all very confidential any data breach happening is going to cause the organization at the day end plus the it security policies it pol- procedures you know awareness among the employees that aapko koi bhi typical category ka mail aa raha hai need not click on those links so these kind of it policies security procedures you know awareness among the employees is also very must uh into my past experiences also i'd seen that you know there are a lot of uh such kind of mailers going on i like to quote one of the examples and uh, that's pertaining to there was you know a mail breach which has happened and uh, there was a very unusual mail which came in uh, to the cfo requesting to transfer certain amount of money uh, this was all over a mail and that mail id was used of was a particular ceo so the ceo wrote to the cfo that uh, you know certain amount has to be transferred and it has to be done immediately i am in a meeting so do not try to call me back but this is to be done i am in particular country and dealing with this sort of individuals so this was very unusual and uh, cfo you know immediately raised an alarm that you know never had this happened in past that these kind of things have come to me directly and of that sort of urgency and uh, the amount was also unusual it was not a usual business amount so he before making those payments you know thus uh, you know it was not the fraud which has happened but before making those payments he tried to reach him and tried to you know text him and until unless the confirmation done the payment was not actually you know it has happened thus the organization was saved out of it but had it been the other thing around and he would have made those payment it would have been you know huge hit to the organization uh this was the case wherein the cfo was getting a request similarly there were instances wherein the people down the line who are just processing the payments them getting you know similar kind of request those kind of you know emailers do come to you know people who are interested with payments so again you know i was talking about the awareness part so it becomes really important for the organization to look into these kind of aspects and ensure that there is you know proper awareness amongst the employees that any these kind of things any exceptional items or entities coming in one must you know thoroughly scrutinize it before getting into it 
in past i have seen not only you know uh, it's it's a direct request payment a lot of times you know there are multiple aspects which comes into place like apple vouchers amazon coupon codes these kind of things are being asked so that there is no physical trail left when these coupons are redeemed so all these things you know in today's world in ai world you know do uh, tend to be a risk but as i mentioned it policy security policies continuous risk assessment awareness among the employees all these play a very 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 critical aspect and definitely you know on top of it the learning and development of the people interested with these kind of things is really very important because of the evolving technology so you know this this could be of lot of help for any organization to prevent or then also detect these kind of aspects so uh, I'll, i'll submit my response here. thank you very much sir uh, it was a really nice uh, uh, thoughts and nice the inputs which you have given and which we should keep in the mind about uh, we should look after in this uh, ai era because uh, right nowadays uh, there are so many sms uh, or emails even for uh, individuals that you have, yes i have gone outside the country and i have lost all the my things and please send me uh, this much amount to this account blah blah and so many times it happens also some of our uh, good friends or some of our uh, well wishers also transfer the money and they become the part of this frauds and they are become the victims of those things so yes it's uh, really it is a uh, very minor level but in a, it's a company it comes to company it will become a very major it becomes a, a very highlightable fraud so thank you very much for giving this insights now let us uh, take a question uh, to see abhilash ramit sir yes sir uh, now uh, internal audit which you are conducting for they also we are providing this scope uh, at a initial level that this are the scope of the audit and you to do this much this much this much now as uh, discussed in the our earlier session that if we are finding something out of the box that which are not written in our scope and which we think it is necessary to mention to the board that it has it is being happening or it is going to be happen and it uh, if we ignore those uh, criteria it will become a major fraud to the company so how to do this and uh, uh, one more thing if we have been given this scope the management which has been given it has been changed now what will uh, we do in those type of situation what is the uh, idea safeguard for internal auditor because ultimately everything comes on auditor only kuch bhi hua auditor ne dhyan nahi diya auditor kya kar raha tha very soft target nowadays is auditor and as we are uh, facing that is nafra so it's very difficult and very heavy penalty we are uh, facing right nowadays so how to safeguard our interest as a internal auditor so please give some guidelines on those uh, aspects so addressing your first concern regarding the scope yes see scope is always a guiding factor that this is a bare minimum responsibility so scope is treated as a bare minimum see up to that level you have to perform beyond scope if you will perform they won't say no but then we have to decide what is to be done what is not to be done now in your particular query it has been a serious concern or a serious fraud may have come to your notice but still it was not your own scope now as earlier discussed internal audit is a preventive exercise so you can't say this was not in my scope so i won't treat it i won't delve with it right so if it is a serious issue you should definitely brought to the notice of the management it is in your interest because it will be your reputation also that yes though it was not in your scope you have highlighted it properly and management is saved from their financial losses and their reputation damages coming to the second question whether internal audit scope given by management has changed right so new management has come into the existence so again of course scope you should discuss with new management you should well document it with the consent of management that this was my scope with the earlier management and now since the management has been changed it is our duty that we have been discussing the same scope whether they want to enhance the scope yes you can consider it based on your commercials whether that has to be considered or that has not to be considered but definitely you should take approval of the new management also on the scope so that tomorrow there is no second thought by the management that this was our our thought 
this was the earlier philosophy you should work accordingly you should do it you should not do it this kind of conflict can be avoided even with the new model so this is my submission on the second question correct you mentioned that uh, uh, if you are finding anything beyond your scope and which is a very uh, as per your opinion it is a very serious issue you should brought to the management uh, level so how to go ahead in that type of scenario because uh, if you are reporting to some higher level senior level it's saying it's okay let it go let it go and if you are going directly to a uh, higher authority higher level of the management they will say why you directly come you should uh, uh, came to proper channel right and that type of scenario documentation is always always there that it will uh, safeguard our interest but right. how to proceed in that type of situation that if some person uh, senior level says it's okay higher level says no it's not okay in some type of conflict between those then how so, to safeguard our interest so this is our professional skepticism so yes we have to deploy it properly because see sometimes because at the lower level they will always resist that their defaults are not reported to the upper level because you should then you should assess the situation this being a very serious one you should buzz them at least whether they want to take action they they don't want to take the action but according to me if it is a suspected fraud fraudulent situation no one will uh, like desist from taking any action so you should definitely despite of resistance from the lower level you should report to the higher level though it was not in your scope you will be forced like don't don't report don't report but you should be very firm in your approach and you should definitely report okay thank you sir. Uh, there is one question in q and a tab that a lot of times in the course of audit an auditor come across risk or red flags in the area which may not be covered in the scope is it the duty of internal auditor to deep dive into such risk and include those in his report so again on same well, line <laughs> yeah so already i have answered the same yes yeah, so uh, it's always a uh, better to go in deep and uh, report to the management uh, it is always for safeguard of our self and as well as as the company absolutely yes yeah, so uh, uh, yes, uh now this are uh, some questions uh, to open the panel yes sir uh, uh, sachin sir you want to mention something yeah yeah so i just wanted to have a quick word you know um, if i'm allowed two three minutes i would like sure. to say two things so in the last question that you said and uh, mr ramin said rightly that see you know in a in a in a private organization even in listed companies large companies uh, the mandate to the internal auditor is very simple there are two things the management expects management and the board expects from the internal auditor one to help the company achieve its objectives and two to help the company keep out of trouble expectations are simple and two but if you think about them between them they cover everything help me achieve my objectives and keep me out of trouble ab isme kaun sa scope mein kya nahi aaya sab kuch to aa gaya so under the sky everything is covered everything is there <laughs> so so uh, be very very when you talk of scope another thing which i wanted to say and emphasize on is is because the topic today is on on fraud you see uh, you will in the field of fraud you all of us will agree that prevention is always always better than detection right Uh, I was a part of a panel many years ago where the co-panelist was a very learned police officer from Mumbai. His name is Mr. Dhananjay Kamlakar. Mr. Dhananjay Kamlakar was the Joint Commissioner of Police of Mumbai, uh, in charge of the crime branch. So, so all kinds of things which can go wrong, the gentleman has handled. While uh, all of us don't think very highly of police, uh, when I was sitting next to Mr. Kamlakar, he made a very pertinent statement which I keep with me even today. He said, in the large cities like Mumbai, Ahmedabad, Delhi, Gurgaon, where crime rate is seemingly high, if you look at the data, it is very very low. But seemingly because we always think in in absolute numbers, the data is very high. Police को सब तरह जगह से गाली ही मिलती है, because every day you know the murders, the dakaitis, the loots, the rapes, they all come. on the paper what does not come and what the police is rated upon is the number of crimes the police prevented from happening by being there at the right place at the right time and like the hindi movie we say ki police to hamesha picture ke end mein aati hai sab kuch hone ke baad but many a times through their intelligent detections police is able to thought to avert to stop the crime 
But the problem with the department is those are never, because there is no data about them. Hence, they are not published. Taking this through today, uh, after having spent seven years at my current organization, I do not get a pat on the back. I have not taken audit observations. If I didn't take as many as I was taken seven years ago, then what did I do? कितने अभी नहीं निकलते हैं वही एरिया में कितना टाइट हो गए हम लोग कितने प्रिवेंटिव हमने निकाले एज अ रिजल्ट ऑफ विच सेम एफर्ट हायर टेक्नोलॉजी बेटर विजिलेंस बट ऑब्जर्वेशन आर नॉट कमिंग मीन्स दर्गेनाइजेशन इम्यूनिटी इज इम्प्रूविंग दर्गेनाइजेशन एल ओडी वन एल ओडी टू इज बेट मीन फार मोर एक्टिव एंड रोबस्ट दैट्स हाउ सम ऑफ दैच्योर्ड ऑर्गेनाइजेशन रेट देयर इंटरनल ऑडिट सिस्टम One of the critical tools here is communication. Now, how many of us know, as a as a matter of trivia, that third uh, Wednesday of October, every third Wednesday of October, worldwide is known as World Ethics Day. Are we aware of this? No. But we are aware of this. That third Wednesday of October, please Google it. Nowadays it is very easy. It's called as the World Ethics Day. So on 18th of October. the last wednesday day we took on all our sites and hos a ethics pledge so in front of the hod his respective department raised the hand and we have a simple pledge we took that pledge this is a positive communication my, my experience and our clinical data given by external organizations also and external agencies tell very important thing in the population of 100 there are two fraudsters two people two percent people are bad apples by design they are in the system to take an undue advantage of the system 90 out of 100 and i'm very proud to say this as indian 90 out of 100 indians want to live the life of of a straight high moral values we come to work to work honestly work hard and make our living positively this is our parents upbringing this is our value system this is our sanskars 8% 100 minus 90 minus 2 8% Unfortunately, are fence sitters. They are neither here nor there, which means that if the circumstances allow them, they yeah. would go on the two percent. Not because they are bad. Sometimes people have serious financial crunch in the family. They have a serious disease. They have some problem. Some of them have serious bad habits like gambling, alcohol, or anything other thing for which the normal living doesn't allow them. Our job is always to keep those eight percent in check. And stop them from converting into those two percent. This you do all kinds of technology and and vigilance. This will happen, but this will have a limited success. But if you keep on giving a positive as well as a negative communication continuously, with or without reasons, the organization will understand that this is one area which is not doable. The the effort reward relationship, the odds are extremely stacked against me. Like for example, our TP, the Transparency and Ethics Policy, shows zero tolerance against any kind of wrongdoing. Zero tolerance. And and what uh, another thing? Uh, again, this is in public domain. Just eight days ago, Citibank fired their analyst, one of the senior analysts who was in London office, for billing extra sandwich, extra coffee, and extra donut. Uh, which he said, which he he bought for his partner, but he built in the daily office uh, this, and that amount was within his uh, daily uh, routine. That is uh, whatever we call it as a DA, a daily allowance, some hundred pounds. This entire bill was twenty seven pounds, twenty seven pounds for himself, twenty seven pounds for his partner, fifty four pounds he built in his name. It was investigated. It was found the city bank fired him. Please check this case. It is available on the net. He went to the court. He went to the London court and said, "This is extremely harsh punishment for what I have done." The court upheld the uh, the uh, action taken by City Bank because it said that you were asked first. You lied. You made a mistake. It was a minor mistake. Had you committed that? Yes, I did it. My uh, whatever. My temptation went better off me. I apologize and I take back the claim. You had a chance with the warning. Your job could have been saved. But you knowing very well that you. You committed a fraud. You did it, and now you cannot say that. And and you know the organization's policies. You know the zero tolerance towards this. 
why I have taken five minutes of the learned panel and uh, audiences. If and this message also was given in the company very wide and clear. Think that then later on do not say that. Are you too small? Yeah, I have made two hundred rupees claim. Kiya. Fraud is a fraud. Smaller or bigger doesn't make a difference. If you keep on and this is a very harsh communication. Do positive communication. Wherever we have found people quoting frauds, stopping uh, this. One of our security guards took extra risk and stopped a Myvan panel from stealing. We brought him to HO. We did his felicitation. The fellow felt so good. He, we put his photographs to all the sites, saying that this man, and we gave him a out of turn promotion. This was positive communication. The bottom line is a communication done properly is a solid tool, yeah, in prevention and early detection of frauds. Thank you. Yes, Abhilesh, you want to mention something? Yeah, I would like to add on this ethics policy. One of the famous car manufacturing company, those German-based company having plant in India, they have similar kind of policy. All their employees are not allowed to accept any gift from anyone. Even in Diwali, when the gift courier comes, they are thrown away from the security gate itself. So stricter policy, zero tolerance. They are not allowing a single gift to be accepted, and their employees are so humble. They are not accepting any gift from any of the dealers also. So this is a stricter ethics policy that, like you give an example of Citibank, it's a very smaller amount. That doesn't mean that you should allow to breathe the context, and that has to be followed in true spirit. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, every panelist. As the uh, time has uh, reached, so uh, let us give a conclusion to this. Uh, any uh, concluding remarks? Anyone wants to make for the uh, today's session? Yes, sir. Uh, Aditya, sir, any concluding remarks? So I would say, um, you know, right from the beginning of the session, uh, I guess, uh, you know, the member had made very relevant points about right from documenting the aspects then you know such an emphasis on how the ground level execution should be linked with the audit plans and then abilaj is also making you know right statement in terms of how you know the things should be looked from a perspective of even the smes so i guess all the domains in the arenas were touched upon and i guess it was very insightful for me also in terms of learning some of the very best practices or you know good practices which corporates are following or uh, you know how the things could be looked into from a different perspective or different lens i guess for me that would be the key takeaway of you know how the things should be taken up uh, in in today's world and that would be the key learning for me as well yes uh, thank you aditya sir thank you sachin sir thank you abhilash sir for providing uh, your wonderful time and wonderful insights and yes uh, today one more thing we have learned that uh, if uh, anything uh, apart from documentation which can save us or which should be there, it is communication. If you have properly communicated anything and then it is being violated, then you can take action and action speaks louder than words. So yes, it is uh, there. Now, uh, just a minute, if uh, uh, if we have so many questions, let me check that and then we can go for concluding. We, uh, everyone is uh, praising this session and uh, everyone is saying thanks to the panelists. So yeah, it's a hearty word of thanks on behalf of WIRC for providing your valuable time on even uh, the Shera, which is uh, generally a holiday, but uh, giving insightful thoughts and uh, so many knowledgeful uh, discussion and uh, practical aspects providing by all of the faculties, all the panelists. So thank you very much. And uh, thank you for uh, your precious time. Thank you WIRC for uh, providing this opportunity and uh, this uh, session. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to my co-panelists, to you, uh, Jackie Mai, and uh, it was a pleasure to attend this session. Uh, after a long time, I had a session like this uh, because nowadays the pressure of the daily work, and especially this is the um, festive season for for us. This is a lot of work season. There are yes. two things. One is that this is the the, the crux season for us in terms of sales, etc. Plus, mm. this is a half yearly closing. We have our board meeting around the corner, so so there is a crunch time. But still, I took some time out because. There is nothing more fruitful for a professional to interact with other uh, professionals and to sort of learn a couple of things from them and to share your experiences with them. But from that perspective, thanks all. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Very thank much. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.